Great to be here. The adjustment has really been easy back to the U.S. and back to, uh, it's great to be here at Fair Mormon and see so many friends, including some who have strong Congolese connections. And so, greetings to you all. Um, today, I'd like to share a few stories about some of the saints in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, for once, I'll say something that's consistent with the title. Um, and I'm going to frame these in terms of six stories that corresponded to six Christ-like attributes. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, could somebody get me some water? I think I'm going to have a little bit of a dry throat. So I'm going to begin with some of the incidents in the lives of Day and Angelique Tarr, whose examples uh, illustrate the power of faith. Well, except for... Uh, what do I need to do, Trevor? Reopen? Thank you. There we go. Okay. Uh-oh. Restart. Okay, there we are, I think. This is a photograph of Nieda Chea, Detar's uh, biological mother. Day grew up in Liberia. His name was originally David, the name of the uncle who raised him. But when a second brother came along, the uncle split the name in two, to be fair. So the original David became Day, and his brother was named Vid. Believe it or not, that's a true story. <laughs> During a military coup in Liberia, Day was beaten by soldiers who broke into their house, and his back was seriously fractured. His brother Emmanuel was killed. The family scattered to parts unknown, and he was left on his own. Now to Day's wife, Angelique. Angelique was born in the Kasai region of DR Congo to Jerome Kabongo and Madeleine Oja. Her father was arrested and jailed in the war that broke out after the execution of Patrice Lumumba, the first prime minister after Congo became independent in 1960. Angelique remembers hiding in the bush as a toddler with the family to evade soldiers. Her family was not amused when she would innocently imitate the loud sound each time gunfire was heard. In 1985, Angelique came to live with her sister's family in Liberia, and in 1988 joined the fledgling LDS branch in Monrovia. Day was baptized a month after Angelique, and due to the persistent encouragement of a senior missionary couple, they became better acquainted. Mission, uh, on the 31st of March, 1990, Day and Angelique, who were at center in this photo, were married by the mission president, Miles Cunningham, in the branch meeting house. Day, still a recent convert, was then serving as a counselor to the mission president. When the Liberian Civil War intensified, President Cunningham was directed to leave the country. Day was called as interim mission president. He was told he could continue with his regular day job, but would need to supervise the missionaries and move to the mission home. Day was happy to serve, but balked at the idea of moving to the mission home. He and Angelique had just moved into their own home. They loved their small garden pictured here. They pleaded with the mission president to allow them to stay, but in the end, they followed the counsel of their leaders. Day, day later recounted, quote, After we moved to the mission house, our own house was bombed. Some of the rebels who knew me saw the, the war as an opportunity to kill me. The rebels who had bombed our house went back to their group rejoicing. They said they had killed me, my wife, and my baby. Day remembered gratefully, we were blessed through our obedience in leaving our home. Conditions in the mission home became difficult. Day and Angelique were stranded for about three months without water. They survived by catching rain water in a leaky sink. And to make matters worse, Angelique was expecting their first child. As the rebels advanced toward the capital city of Monrovia, they knew they could wait no longer for the baby's delivery. Day drove Angelique through roving groups, groups of soldiers to the hospital. The doctor quickly induced labor and Day picked up the mother and baby the next morning. Soon afterward, the rebels closed the road, broke into the hospital, and chased everyone out. Although the baby was not eligible for evacuation by the U.S. Embassy because she was technically Liberian, being born in Liberia, Day and Angelique pleaded and prayed, and to their great joy, an exception was granted. Angelique and the baby were transported by helicopter and boat to Freetown, where President Cunningham provided lodging. Day saw this incident as another testimony that God blesses us. Some of you have seen the LDS film Freetown about the evacuation of a group of Liberian missionaries. With President Cunningham absent, it was actually Day who had to make arrangements with the Liberian government to allow these missionaries to leave for Sierra Leone. Rather than going with him, he stayed in the mission home so he could be available to communicate with the government military commanders if there were problems en route. 
Time precludes a detailed retelling of all the horrors and all the miracles experienced by day during the months that followed, but uh, those have all been recorded and written up if there are people who are interested in this story. These include an arrest by soldiers convinced that the missionaries were rebel spies, followed by his miraculous re release, being put in a line of men moving toward the sea to be shot one by one, and then being saved by an unknown rescuer, delirium and confusion from lack of food, following a prompting to leave a ship dock that was bombed 45 minutes later, and after six months of waiting, a 29-hour voyage by rescue ship to Sierra Leone, on which many sick and weak individuals died. President Cunningham came to the port in Freetown to learn whether Day had made it on what was to be <coughs> the last rescue boat. <coughs> After seeing the many dead bodies being removed from the ship, he went to comfort Angelique, telling her that Day was not aboard. <coughs> he arrived back home. President Cunningham saw Day sitting on his porch. He shouted, come with me in the car right now. We're going to see Angelique. Day recounted, Angelique heard our knock on the door. She didn't want to come. She thought that someone had come to disturb her in her grief. We knocked and knocked and knocked and knocked. Finally, she came with one of the missionaries. She saw the mission president, and then she saw me. Angelique added, it was like a dream when I saw him. I couldn't believe that it was him. I cried, and so many things came to my mind at once. It had been six months. He was so slim, and his pants were so baggy and full of so many holes. Day and Angelique went on to raise a faithful family in Kinshasa, DR Congo, blessing many lives through their dedicated service to God and their neighbors. No longer a hunted enemy of the Liberian soldiers, Day recently served his country as an advisor for an important national economic development mission. As capstone to that mission, he was hosted this week by the President and First Lady of Liberia at an Independence Day reception in Monrovia. Having seen this hand of God repeatedly in the lives of his family, Day is a witness to the power of faith. He testifies, quote, God is doing things for Africa. I always say to people, the more the situation threatens, the more God is near. Although conditions have calmed in Liberia, the DR Congo continues to suffer from near constant warfare. Since its independence, there have never, there's never been a peaceful change of government. At least 70 armed groups cur are currently operating in the east of the country. As elsewhere in the world, the suffering is intense and death is commonplace, especially for children caught in the crossfire. Through contributions from members of the church, LDS Charities recently was able to offer a million dollars toward alleviating hungry, hunger in war-torn areas of DR Congo. In addition to these significant financial contributions, the church is promoting helpful changes in the philosophy of giving that will allow these contributions to be more health effective and long-lasting. For example, at a recent uh, conference in London, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland called on non-governmental organizations, governments, and faith-related groups to refocus their efforts, saying, quote, in the past, charitable institutions have provided financial support, medical treatment, and other physical needs for refugee victims, all of which are still needed. But we now understand that we must look to emotional and spiritual needs as well, end of quote from Elder Holland. Often the emotional and spiritual needs of individuals are best addressed through the humble efforts of ordinary but extraordinarily caring families. Though less visible to others than the financial and logistical help the DR Congo receives through generous friends in many nations, evidence of the spirit of char Christ-like charity of the Congolese people themselves blesses their country in intangible but highly significant ways. This is the home of Alain Mota in Mpoke Nsele on the Bateke Plateau. Alain, not yet a member of the church, is a school teacher in another village that is an hour away by motorcycle. At left, Alain's wife inter interrupts her laundry chores to bathe the child. Alain said he had four children. I decided to capture them on film individually from youngest to oldest. Here's the first child I saw. This is the second child. This is the third child, a daughter. And this was, as I understood it, the fourth son. Fourth child, a son. But wait, if he has four children, who then is this toddler, a fifth child? When the parents finally gathered everyone for a group photo, we learned that there were at least 10 children living in their small home, their own four plus six others. 
A friend observed that the unsponsored domestic charity of the individual Congolese families is a significant contributor to the welfare of children at risk. Indeed, given pervasive war, famine, and poverty in many parts of the Congo, there are far fewer orphans in institutions and on the street than one might otherwise expect. So many people, even the very poor, take abandoned children like these into their homes out of pure goodness. We who are so richly blessed in material ways must learn to emulate the giving in kind of such families, impoverished in means, yet rich in the spirit of love. Who can say what form of charity will produce the most significant and long-lasting results? The financial and te technical support of generous international friends or the rigorous toil of our Christ-like Congolese neighbors who sacrifice what little they have to secure the future of Congo's children? As we shared a small stack of pass-along cards with an image of Jesus on the front to the thrill of the children, it was clear from the expression of this saintly mother that she knew, as we knew, something of the inexhaustible goodness of the Savior on whom they relied. He was not only the source of their daily bread and daily breath that allowed them to live, but also of the daily strength that inspired them to love. Other children are not so lucky. The United Nations envoy responsible for rescuing children from difficult, exploitative situations in our part of the Congo told us that there are at least 30,000 street children in Kinshasa alone. He said that about 70% of them actually had parents, but were expelled from their homes by mothers and fathers who have become convinced they are possessed by an evil spirit. That's 70% of those children on the streets. Such parents, desperate to find the source of troubles and tragedies in their homes, are victims of ill-founded confidence in exorcists. These exorcists are typically motivated by large payments to find a scapegoat in one of the family's children. Here Moise, French for Moses, a street child we came to love, watched himself on the street. Elder and Sister Romney, our public affairs couple, always had a soft spot in their hearts for such children. For various reasons, these children were often short of clothing. Elder and Sister Gates, our temple construction couple, decided that Moise needed a new shirt and gave him this one. He really liked it, but understandably it did not stay clean for long and soon disappeared. One day, Elder and Sister Huber, our humanitarian couple, found Moise lying on the street and bleeding profusely. A man had made him carry some glass, but in doing so, a piece cut his hand deeply. The man had fled. Had the Hubers not found him, he might have bled to death. Because Good Samaritan laws are of limited effectiveness in the DR Congo, the missionaries have to walk the fine, a fine line, offering help in a crisis while not putting the church or themselves in a situation of liability. In this case, the Hubers made sure that Moise got urgent care. Here, Sister Byrell, the wife of the mission president and a trained nurse, put on a clean bandage. Of course, many of these children do not make it to adulthood. Those who survive on the streets are at risk for drugs, crime, abuse, and exploitation. Moise and others would watch for us as we walked to church on Sunday mornings. Sometimes they would attend church with us. When Moise would see my wife Kathleen coming, he would run to her, jump up and hug her tight, and would not let go. Kathleen returned in kind. He had no mother of his own who could give him such a hug. This scene came to mind later when we were introduced to this painting by Liz Lemon Swindle of a group of children from Zambia greeting an artist's model for Jesus. The painting served as a reminder that some of these boys may grow up to be missionaries. Vincent Sakala at Wright later served in our mission. His twin brother Victor served a mission in Uganda at the same time and both were released the same week. Kathleen arranged for them to meet at the Nairobi airport on their way home to Zambia. We also remember the story of Bernard Balibuno. As a teenager, over a period of several months, he made his way alone from the DR Congo to South Africa with no money and no passport during the turbulence of the last days of Mobutu Sese Seko, the notorious dictator. Homeless and hungry, standing with a group of friends outside a bus station, the mission president spotted him and felt moved to approach him. Eventually, Bernard joined the church and through the support of member friends in his ward was able to attend BYU Hawaii. Eventually, he convinced Yaya, a childhood friend still living in his village in the DR Congo, to come to Hawaii. She also joined the church and they were married. One child later, Bernard received his diploma and was asked to speak at the graduation ceremony. 
After finishing a graduate degree at George Washington University in the BYU Marriott School of Management, Bernard returned to the DR Congo. This once wandering waif now serves as the national director for, of the Catholic Agency for Overseas Development, CAFOD, responsible for a large portfolio of humanitarian projects. Recognizing how others have blessed their lives, Bernard and Yaya have helped raise several children of extended family and friends in addition to providing for their own large family. Obedience. The Congolese saints are on the whole a faithful and obedient people. This is epitomized in the fact that according to Elder Johnny Koch, the DR Congo mission is not only among the fastest growing in the world, uh, we had about 200 baptisms a month just in our mission, with the same number in the other, two mis three, other three missions in the areas of the Congo, but also has the highest rate of sacrament meeting attendance, double the percentage of a typical stake in the United States. Quiet evidence of faithfulness and devotion is to be found everywhere. While waiting for a meeting in the mission office, Brother Tito Chibanda quietly made notes on a beautifully printed document of perhaps 20 pages, I asked him what he was doing, and he said it was a draft of the plan that had been drafted by the ward council for the coming year. As a counselor in the bishopric, he was adding some personal suggestions before the plan was finalized. We enjoyed shaking hands with the young men in the Uronic priesthood who came early to lie in the walkway with Bishop M.A. and greet the members of the ward before sacrament meeting. We loved the innocence of the little children and the dedication of their teachers. We were thrilled with the joy of singing the hymns together with heartfelt enthusiasm and the evident love these saints had for one another. In the mission office, we re regularly received visits of members of the church from remote areas of the mission that had no organized branch in their city or village. Because of difficulties in sending these donations by other means, they often came long distances to bring their tithes and offerings in person. Pascal Lamboto, a beloved associate in the mission office, serves as a bishop. He told movingly of the example of a widow in his ward who walked long distances to be at Sunday meetings each week and to pay her tithes and offerings. He said that 60% of the people in the DR Congo, particularly those who live outside the major cities, live on a dollar or two per day, and that 90% eat only one meal per day or less. One day there was a vigorous discussion in the mission office among a group of local brothers who were waiting to meet with Bishop Pascal, shown in the, in the background. They were discussing the passage in the Handbook of Instructions, Volume 2, where members are taught that, quote, proper fast day observance includes abstaining from food and drink for two consecutive meals in a 24-hour period, end of quote. Some who only ate once each day were wondering if their fast should last 48 hours rather than the prescribed 24 hours. Fasting for 48 hours would allow them to fast and donate the equivalent of two consecutive meals. Bishop Pascal assured them that a 24-hour fast was sufficient. Doctrines and principles relating to the family play a very important role in a place where marriage and children are so highly prized. Brother and Sister Milambo have been faithful members of the church almost since its beginning. Brother Milambo served as the first stake president in Lubumbashi, the most important city in the DR Congo after its capital, Kinshasa. Here is a traditional sign of respect. Brother Milambo poses for the photo, not by looking directly at the ca camera, but instead in ga by gazing in deference at the wife he loves and honors. They have been married for over 60 years. Sister Milambo became a bride at age 12. Nowadays, the marriage of young children is rare. This is the invitation received to the reception of Bijou Kadikulu, a sister who served in our mission, who is about to marry another returned missionary. Marriage in the Congo is still a complex business. Typically, families insist on traditional marriage ceremonials that precede the civil marriage, including a substantial dowry. For some, the traditional marriage is sufficient. However, the church, in addition, requires a civil marriage before a church marriage at the meeting house can take place. Temple marriage in the Johannesburg South Africa Temple follows the civil marriage as soon as circumstances permit, including the considerable expense of passports, visa, airfare, and lodging. The various implications of marriage law are sufficiently difficult to comprehend that our ward held a two-hour fireside featuring Bishop M. Ngoy, Brother Stan Kalala, an expert on Congolese marriage law, and Brother Daddy Kampoy, a seasoned church leader, to explain their details to young adults. 
A persistent concern relating to marriage throughout Africa is the requirement of, a lar of large marriage dowries, essentially a bride price. The church teaches that members, members that dowries are harmful and degrading to women, lead to couples postponing marriage and family, and handicap them financially just as they are trying to make a start in life. Eliminating the practice is difficult because even if a member couple wants to do away with these traditions, extended family can exert great pressure on them to conform. Running a countercurrent to these traditional dowry practices is the story of Thierry and Natalie Mutombo. Thierry comes from a faithful LDS family whose num members now span three generations. Here Thierry and Natalie's son Jason Colombo Mutombo is shown with Elder Neil A. Anderson at the groundbreaking of the Kinshasa Temple. Thierry's father at left and mother, shown at right with Thierry and his little sister Fifi, had each attended different churches, but a dream about the Book of Mormon settled the question for the father. He knew he had found the truth. Thierry was baptized, along with his father and mother, in the cold waters of the swimming pool at the Hotel Okapi on 22nd of June, 1986. This was only the second baptismal service to be held in the country. After returning from a mission to the Ivory Coast, Thierry began to prepare for marriage. His mother was the first to mention his future wife to him. She said, we have an exceptional missionary serving here, Sister Sinda. She's very nice. She's unbelievable. If one day you found a way to marry that sister, I'd be the happiest woman in the world. <laughs> but Thierry's mind was on other things at the time, and he didn't follow up. However, one day a former missionary companion convinced him to come along on an outing and unexpectedly, he found himself at Natalie's doorstep the day after she had returned home from her mission. <laughs> Thierry and Natalie hit it off and before long began to make marriage plans. Natalie was an orphan and her uncles were responsible for her upbringing. They asked for a very large dowry, even by Congolese standards. Thierry went to his father with the little money he had saved from working here and there, but his father said, no, 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 you can't go to them with that. They won't accept it. Natalie and Cherry continued to make large sacrifices to buy little things on the long list of dowry items the uncles had given them. Thierry again went to his father and pleaded with him to write Natalie's family the formal letter that would allow them to start marriage negotiations. It had gotten to the point where the couple felt they had no more they could give. Finally, Thierry's father relented. When Thierry's father presented Natalie's uncles with what little they had been able to scrape together, the uncles were angry and said they would not accept it. Then, according to Thierry, quote, that day I learned that my wife really loved me. She went back to her uncles and told them three things. One, what you were asking this brother to pay you, he doesn't have. Two, the marriage is about him and me, it's not about you. And three, if you don't want to accept what he brought, I will no longer be your child. Her uncles came back and said, we're going to take what you brought after all. But we will not organize a wedding reception. There won't be a wedding reception. I, speaking of Terry, looked at my father and said, what's important for me is the marriage and not the reception. So they, we they took what little we had given them. We had our civil marriage, and after that we had our marriage blessed at the church. I told the bishop, we're not going anywhere after the church wedding because we don't have any money to organize a reception. Those who want to wish us well will just have to go home afterward because I don't even have the money to buy soft drinks. After the civil marriage, the members of the ward organized something. The brothers of the Relief Society brought some juice, and the Relief Society sister made beignets with some little sacks of peanuts, and those were the refreshments for our marriage. Two years later, Thierry and Natalie were sealed in the Johannesburg Temple. Thierry said, quote, The lesson I learned is that we need to focus on what is most important, and for me, the most important thing was my marriage to my wife. This spring, Thierry was released from his call as president of the Messina Stake in Kinshasa. Since July 1st, he is serving as the president of the Baltimore, Maryland Mission. Diligence. Family history work in places like DR Congo calls for a particular kind of diligence. This story illustrates the quiet work of the institutional church the local, uh, and the local saints are doing on an impressively large scale to preserve vanishing family records. Some of this important work is taking place with little fanfare within the Hotel de Ville or the town hall of Kinshasa. 
The nondescript entrance to the room assigned to the family history team is on the third floor of this well-guarded building. Though in entering there is nothing oppressive to the naked eye, a sweet and temple-like spirit of quiet diligence filled the room. The deliberately darkened windows shut off and set apart this space from the clamor of the city. Two return missionaries and one city employee were working full-time to digitize government records. The team was supervised by Silvestre Mambasa. The records in question were application for government identity cards from 1925 to 2015, the last time such cards were issued. The importance of preserving these applications is made greater by the fact that there has been no census in the country for more than 30 years. This record from 1942, still the era of Belgian colonization, contains personal information about Manuel Zuzi, whose profession is listed as travailleur, worker. Information about his parents is also listed. Often parents and children have completely different family names, making it very difficult to trace family ties between them without such evidence. Each week the hard disks are shipped to Salt Lake City for further processing and eventually indexing by volunteers. A copy of the records database, of course, will be given to the government. In the World Report from last year, April's General Conference, you may have seen Cherry Mutombo that we just talked about, among others, speaking about a new and urgent initiative to gather family histories in Africa in places where the only records are those of human recollection. Brother Mutombo wept as he told me about an elderly man who told him that he had come too late because many of those who could have reconstructed their family history from memory had already passed on. A trip to gather oral histories from a village chief relatively close to Kinshasa was being planned for early May. The lead for the team was Daniel Tusi Kula, an early member of the church, who was the first state president in Messina and the first Congolese Area 70. He and his wife, Therese, seemed a perfect match for each other. They had witnessed some of the most important scenes in DR Congo church history. For example, more than 20 years ago, they participated in the first temple trip of Congolese saints to Johannesburg while Therese was expecting their first child. This portrait includes the youngest segment of the Kola's 12 children. They are living proof of the fruits of gospel living in the home. Blaz and his wife, the couple in the white t-shirt and blue dress on the back row, were expecting a child at the time. Blaz was still seeking employment. Because work is scarce, the family lives to a great degree off what their garden and chickens produce. The picture above the dining room table was consistent with the Christ-centered nature of their home. President Cola's pro former profession as a school teacher was evidence. Oh, wow. Hold on. was evident in his careful record-keeping, his pains for perfect French grammar, and his meticulous handwriting. Brother Kola is an enthusiast for family history and the steward of unique treasures of church history in the Congo. Irreplaceable photographs, myriad documents and letters, and a handwritten draft of a manuscript with details of 30 years of church history in the DR Congo. One treasured letter sits in the center of the table from Carol, a sister in Salt Lake City, whose address was in a Book of Mormon given to President Kola when he was investigating the church. Family Search International, you can see their name on this building, has contracted with Brother Kola's nonprofit group to do the oral history work. The village chief lived in Mpoke Nseli in the heart of the Bakiteke Plateau. A first effort to glean detailed information about the location from Google Maps was a total failure. Traveling in just this small region of the DR Congo gave some sense of the vastness of the country, relatively little is which of which is penetrated with transportation arteries. Though on the map you would think we were not very far away in inches from Kinshasa, we were in truth a world away. After a while we left the paved highway. Apart from an occasional motorcycle or large truck, we were the only vehicle on the road. Not far from our destination was this, this little lake of unknown depth that we had to cross in order to turn on the fork of the road at right. Our intrepid driver did not stop to measure the depth, but simply plowed ahead. The engine and exhaust were underwater. I don't know what we would have done if the engine had stopped. 
Unfortunately, transportation in the beautiful village itself was mainly by footpath. Little children eyed our truck curiously. An older son of the village chief removed the log barriers from the gate of the compound, and we were escorted to this shady bower to wait for his arrival. A handful of children and adults began to gather. Finally, Nkie Ngamucho, the chef coutumier, or traditional chief, arrived. In his hands, he held the staff of his office, fringed with buffalo hair and topped with the image of a man and a woman. Speaking in the Lingala language, Brother Kola introduced the efforts of Family Search International to gather word records worldwide. He said that these efforts would allow their family history to be preserved safely forever to the end of the world. That's a quote. I thought that was a neat way to end it. The chief was grateful for this effort and gladly expressed his willingness to help. He felt that the effort would also assist in resolving some local issues, such as dis disputes over tribal leadership or when people might mistakenly marry cousins who were too close. Once the chief was seated, he began to discuss his lineage with the elder to his right, counting generations on his fingers as he spoke. Without help, he was unable to remember any progenitors beyond his grandfather. Eventually, family members in this and other villages would be consulted in order to verify and fill out the record of ancestors and descendants. After the discussion, the chief had the tam-tam, or drum, brought out. Note the wide-eyed expression of the little girl at left. The chief explained that in their village, Friday, the day we were visiting, was the day in which the ancestors were honored. No one goes to work in the fields on Fridays. When he sounds the drum, the people assemble. On Fridays, the chief may experience dreams that provide direction for his people. For example, he may receive warnings that the people should not go into a certain part of the forest, or that the women should not go alone to the stream before a certain time of day. The chief also brought out a leopard skin associated with his office. Her eyes went wider at that. <laughs> the hope is that someday these beautiful children will be blessed by Brother Kola's diligent efforts. The distances and other complexities of this massive gathering effort make it a daunting task. In all, there are 17 different nonprofit groups who have won bids to deploy to different parts of the Congo. Brother Kola's team alone, including those shown here as well as others, had contracted with Family Search to collect 400,000 names in 12 months. The audacity of it all is a tribute to the faith of those whose vision initiated the effort and the diligence of those who ultimately will make it successful. As I think about humility, I think about the many steps, each one small but necessary, that have been required to prepare the church in the DR Congo for a temple. And I remember the scripture, out of small things proceedeth that which is great. The story of Norman and Jenki Komosi describes one of those steps, made possible by events that the Lord had put in motion decades beforehand. Norman Komosi was born in 1939 in a village where his father, who'd been orphaned and raised by Baptist missionaries, took care of a group of several churches in the area. Because Norman was the oldest of ten children, as a boy of six to nine years old, he had the responsibility of foraging and fishing for the family's food. Later, his father was transferred to a Baptist elementary school in Kinshasa. They were very poor and often went without eating. They lived in a small one-bedroom house, that's ten children, where he and his brother slept on the table because there was no other place to lie down. One day, Norman's father told them to pack their bags quickly because they were leaving the house immediately. Wordly, Norman asked his father where they were going, but he wouldn't say. After walking a long time, they entered a large home in one of the neighborhoods of the Belgian colonists. As they entered, his father told him that what he needed to do now is pick out his bedroom. Norman couldn't believe it. Indoor plumbing and all the other amenities, somehow his father had been able to make it happen. He never explained how. The next day, an even more astonishing thing happened. A Belgian man entered their home and began following the family everywhere in the house, taking notes as he went, during meals, as they made the beds, as they prepared for school. He later learned that to be authorized to live or even travel through Belgian neighborhoods, it was required that they pass a qualifying examination. To make a long story short, they passed with flying colors, and after independence, his father became mayor of Leopoldville II, the newer section of what is now the city of Kinshasa. 
Norman, shown at center, was a gifted student, was continually selected for higher educational opportunities, eventually completing graduate work in engineering and finance in Belgium. When he returned to the DR Congo, he joined the newly formed Air Zaire. He became a vice president for the airline and opened up offices for them all around the world. He ran his own businesses as well and eventually became a member of the national parliament, sometimes traveling to other African countries to negotiate strategic alliances. They became very wealthy. Then in 1997, Laurent Désiré Kabila, the father of the current president, came in with troops from the east. Because they were part of the old government, their lives were in danger. His family escaped their compound using tall ladders. Everything in their house was looted. Because no Congolese were permitted to leave the country during the crisis, he had to use his airline connections to sneak his family through the hosting kitchen and board the last flight out to South Africa before the airport closed, and no one would be allowed to come or go. Providentially, the soldiers inspecting the plane did not find them. Norman and Jenke and their children eventually got to Washington, D.C. as refugees. He went from red carpet receptions at hotels to selling vegetables on the street and other odd jobs. They had little food and little hope. After seeing an ad on television, one of Norman's daughters sent in a request to church headquarters for a copy of the videotape, The Lamb of God. It wasn't long before they were visited by Elder Kyle Houghton and Elder Jared Banner. Norman recounts several instances of inspired service and teaching that accompanied their unexpected and somewhat reluctant journey toward baptism. Both Jenke and Norman received powerful confirming witnesses that they should join the church. Jenke's answer came through the fulfillment of a dream. Norman's answer came while pondering and praying and walking the grounds of the Washington, D.C. temple with his family and the missionaries. As the others walked ahead, he felt compelled to stop. Then, he said, a voice came to me telling me, this is the true church of Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith was a true prophet of God. He immediately shouted to the missionaries down the path and said, I'm ready for baptism. Four months later, he was called as branch president for a small inner city group of 24 members. Attendance grew to 200 quickly under his loving leadership. Matthew Bowen, I think is here, who is later a member of his ward, remembers his booming voice as he conducted meetings saying, Welcome to the true church. <laughs> then in 2012, another unexpected event took place. According to Kyle Houghton, my dad and I were having lunch with Brent Roberts and Jared Doxey. They mentioned the difficulties and cost of building in Kinshasa, if they only knew someone from Kinshasa with connections. I mentioned Norman's name, and that was it. Kyle and his father Stan, the owner of Westland Construction, knew that the Lord had put Norman where he needed to be so he could come to Kinshasa and help them. Norman, in his turn, tells many stories of how the Lord has connected the dots in his life's journey to bring him to the happy point where he now is. With great enthusiasm, Norman says, It is a great joy to be involved with building the Kinshasa Temple of the Lord. Although Kyle and Stan were the ones who reached out to get us involved, it was already planned that way by our Heavenly Father. Because I speak the local languages and know the culture, I was given the responsibility of dealing with government agencies, Congolese subcontractors, business leaders, and shipping companies. Things are sometimes done very differently in the DR Congo than in the United States or Europe. My experience as airport director has helped me to smooth out travel and visa challenges. There is always great joy in the face of Norman as he speaks of the temple. Through his humble acceptance of the gospel and his willingness to follow the promptings of the Holy Ghost wherever they lead, he has been brought back home to Kinshasa and to the Lord's holy house. Hope. The last story I'd like to share this afternoon is one of joy, but even more so, one of hope. Of course, as Brother James E. Faulkner reminds us, the kind of hope described in Scripture is not a natural hope for bodily and worldly matters. The hope that our job will be rewarding, the hope that our children will do well in school, that we will get a raise. Christian hope is the hope for salvation, end of quote. Moreover, Christian hope is a palpable divine gift, not simply a vague and wistful longing. Those who have proven faithful obtain an initial hope of attaining God's kingdom when he grants them, quote, the earnest of the spirit in their hearts, end of quote. Such hope provides an anchor, sure and steadfast, to those who suffer indignity and injustice in this life, allowing them to see God's promises with absolute confidence from afar off 
and to be persuaded of them and to embrace them, knowing that God hath prepared for them the supreme inheritance of his celestial city in his own due time. The outside of the shop we are visiting is nothing remarkable. A tiny building measuring perhaps two meters square, inconspicuous among a crowded row of small businesses along the side of a busy, noisy road of packed dirt. Inside the building, a family of five people, a mother, a father, and three children, live and work. There is no electricity and no plumbing. The sign on the wooden doors bears the painting of a wheelchair, indicating that, dis that a disabled person is within. Inside, a man works busily on the child's garment using a pedal-operated sewing machine. The manual pedals for the machine give him complete control of the speed of the machine he needs. Duvoilo wins a David, deftly puts the thread through the needle and cuts it with his teeth. He is totally blind in both eyes. He lost his right eye at two years old when it came out of the socket after a bout with the measles. He lost his left eye at the age of 20. Customers select the style they want from the chart on the wall behind David's machine. His wife, Dotoni Josephine, herself suffering with a motor handicap, tells him the number corresponding to the style chosen. He takes it from there to create the garment. In May 2005, David had a dream in which God asked him, Why are you still alone? Why don't you marry? Three days later, he was sleeping and God spoke to him again. He said, Look at the wife I have chosen for you. She is from the same tribe. She has studied and received a degree, and she is a tailor. I woke up and I thought, ah. David began look, look, looking and eventually was led to Josephine. She was from his tribe. She had a degree, and she was a tailor. But she did not believe he could sew. Impossible, she said to herself, a blind tailor. She came to his shop and was astonished to see him at work with some of his students. He asked if he could come to her shop to be sure she was really a tailor too. <laughs> when he arrived and met her there, he asked her to marry him, and she said no. But during the visit, she gave him a broken sewing machine to repair. He brought it back, and she was again amazed to see that he'd fixed it. After that, she started to visit him regularly. She learned that he was a committed Christian. That was something she had been looking for. They were married. Josephine's friends asked her, why did you fall in love with a blind man, you who are already handicapped yourself? How are you going to manage? Josephine said, none of that matters. The Lord knows these things. What I can't do myself, he can do for me. And what he can't do for himself, I can do for him. That's how we'll support each other. David and Josephine heard about the church in 2008 and began studying the Book of Mormon and other church literature. But the only church building they knew about was far away on the other side of the city. In addition, their friends and relatives discouraged them, saying it was a church of witchcraft and sorcery. Relatives said if, if anyone died in their family, they would blame David and Josephine for it. Eventually, they found out there was an LDS meeting house near them in Njili. They began attending were baptized. David said he found inspiration and testimony in the story of Joseph Smith. He was impressed by the fact that even though the prophet had to move from place to place because of persecution, he never wearied or stopped bearing his testimony so long as he lived. Remembering Joseph Smith keeps David from getting discouraged himself. The family studies the scriptures together, sometimes lengthily when business is slow. Josephine and the children read, and he listens. Josephine's favorite scripture is in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, when the apostles asked Jesus whether a man they saw had been born blind because of his own sin or that of his parents. Jesus answered that both reasons were wrong. Jesus said that it had happened in order that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Josephine also loves the revelation of the Lord to Emma Smith in Doctrine and Covenants 25. She says that Emma was told to be strong in prayer so that she could fortify Joseph Smith. In the same way, she said, she needed to be strong for Brother David. The family has a testimony of tithing. David says, with the little that I earn with my work, we strive to pay our tithing. Even though business isn't working out as well as we'd like, we are still here. And I hope things will get better one day. Even when there is no money, we get along fine and we find a way to manage. They're looking forward to being sealed as a family after the Kinshasa temple is dedicated. Said Josephine, the greatest blessing of the gospel in our life is, first of all, peace. Every day God spares us. We're grateful for our home where we sleep. We don't have any choice. 
Even if there are some rough people around us, even if there is water all around us because of the rain, our good roof keeps the rain from coming down on us. Our health is good. We don't have any sicknesses. We don't have any worries. God truly watches over us with tremendous care ever since we accepted the restored gospel. She continued, we're sometimes concerned because that we don't have much of a place to sleep. To live here with our children is not an easy thing sometimes. Living next to the highway is also dangerous. We're not really safe here. We try to save up so we can have the means of transportation to go where we need to go. With great difficulty, we're able to pay for the children to stay in school. We can't always pay their fees, but we're striving to do so. There are, these are the only concerns we have in our lives. Said David, when I was lo losing my sight, I continued to pray that although there was no real solution, I went to see doctors, hospitals, examinations, until finally they told me that whatever they might try, I was going to be blind anyway. And I was determined from then on, and was given a grace from then on, and I thank the Lord that I am now in this church, and I have a talent I can share with others. Josephine added, Our concern is that we are handicapped, but we don't have much work. We're also concerned for others who are handicapped, but don't have any work, and can only get by by begging. We worry about handicapped children who are often labeled by their families as being bewitched. Our concern is finding a way to do something for these children, to find a way to teach them skills that will allow them to do work so they can do useful things that we, as we've been able to do. It's also a means to share the gospel with others. That's why we dream of being able to create a training center to help our handicapped brothers and sisters. Josephine's favorite hymn is, We Gather Together to Ask the Lord's Blessing. She says, I love the last line of the hymn that says, He remembers us. It says that he remembers us. That includes all of us, without exception, including the handicapped. I know that God remembers us because he gives us the breath of life. From January until now, the month of December, we are in good health. David said, My greatest blessing is that God continues to grant me the breath of life. Many who were born when I was are already gone, but my life has been preserved. And if I'd never learned this trade, I wouldn't be able to share this talent. But because I was able to learn this trade and apply my talents, God gives me my daily bread. I love the hymn, says David, count your blessings. Because when I hear the words, it reminds me of all that God has done for me. God has done so much for me. First, he closed my eyes so I don't see evil and I do not sin. And I think it's a good thing that I don't see evil and I don't sin. And I don't have any worries or difficulties. I count the same blessings that you do. And I am full of joy like you. I know we're short of time. Let me finish my conclusion real quick. As I think about these faithful Congolese saints, I realize that what I love the most is that they take the gospel seriously. For them, the gospel is not simply a part of life. It is their life, their hope, and their joy. Recently, I had a meeting with a revered Congolese church leader who is a great example of devotion and diligence. After our meeting, another church-related meeting was planned. He called the Congolese brother who was in charge of this meeting to confirm the time. But the brother told my friend that he had just returned to Kinshasa by plane, and for that reason, the meeting scheduled for that morning had been canceled. After he hung up, my friend gave the situation some more thought. He realized it couldn't be true that the brother had just returned from Kinshasa because there were no flights that morning. He must have come back the night before. Because he'd returned the night before, there was no reason he couldn't have been available for a meeting that morning. My friend called him again and took him to CAS for having canceled the meeting. I felt sorry for the brother who'd been reproved. I knew that my friend did not realize, perhaps, all the difficulties that might have been going on in his life. But I also understood the sincere urgency in the voice of my friend. Among other things, he had said something like the following to this brother. You like to sleep too much. You cannot sleep when the work of the Lord awaits you. After he hung up the second time, my friend looked me straight in the eye. He said something like this to me. You can sleep, but I can't. You have great-grandparents who are members of the church and who gave you a rich legacy of their example and the blessings of the gospel. But we who are the first generations of the church in the Congo must build this legacy for our posterity from nothing. We don't have time to sleep. His words touched me deeply. I knew that his devotion would be a blessing to his family and to others forever. But I also knew that I had no more time myself for sleep than he did. I remembered the words of Elder Uchtdorf. We must not sleep through the restoration. We let us be awake and not be weary of well-doing, for we are laying the foundation of a great work, even preparing for the coming of the Savior. I also remember the words of J. Reuben Clark, a former member of the First Presidency. Quote, In living our lives, let us never forget 
that the deeds of our fathers and mothers are theirs, not ours, that their works cannot be counted to our glory, that we can claim no excellence and no place because of what they did, that we must rise by our own labor, and that labor failing, we shall fail. We may claim no honor, no reward, no respect, nor special position or recognition, no credit of what our fathers were or what they wrought. We stand upon our own feet in our own shoes. There is no aristocracy of birth in this church. It belongs equally to the highest and the lowliest. For as Peter said to Cornelius, the Roman centurion, seeking him, quote, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. May the Lord bless each one of us to emulate the example of the Congolese saints. Thank you. LDS Charities, there's a question about how they operate. I think that uh, I'm not the rest, best person to ask, uh, answer that, but I'll tell you, they're the best-run charity in the world, I'm sure, for that. So um, please uh, don't be shy to, to give them your best. Can an English-speaking senior couple get along? Certainly. Yeah, we have some couples over there who are very much needed uh, who speak English exclusively. And the mission president, who is Congolese, is learning English now. So. He'll come along too. What, are the tri what tribe or tribes are the saints from? What I'd like to do is recommend to you a little video that's up on the Fairmore website that's entitled, uh, it goes with a little article called uh, What We Can Learn from a Congolese Patriarch. And uh, a friend of ours there, a Congolese Patriarch, a great revered man, there tells a little bit about what he's seen in terms of, of uh, the children of Abraham in that country. Humanitarian efforts of the LDS Church in DR Congo. I only touched upon one. Maybe uh, at another time uh, later on I'm going to say more about uh, some of the wonderful work our humanitarian missionaries do there. But it's uh, very extensive and uh, very much appreciated. Um, I'd like to give to help to the Congolese brothers and sisters. Who can I trust? I'd say be very careful about giving anything directly there. Uh, even those who've been well experienced at giving and running projects find it great difficulty to establish projects there. So I say, as my patriarchal blessing says, by the way, give generously through the agencies of the church, and I think that you'll find the best results for what you're doing. It may be anonymous, but it will go in the right direction, and the church is, is uh, doing a good job there. What can you tell us about the impact of the church's self-reliance initiative in the DRC? Well, there's somebody here in this room named Brent that I think could say more than anything, anybody else on that. So, Brent, if, uh, if you weren't the one who answered this question, raise your hand so others can right talk to you about it. Okay, Brent, so please see Brent with his hand raised there, and he can tell you all about the wonderful things going on. The Congo Temple, the Temple President's called, and um, we hope the construction will be done by the end of the summer. And then dedication, who knows, thereafter. Get a brownie and a 